must unite what has been set aside. We are TFR. Truth Frequency Radio. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, N. Garcia. This is Secrets Revealed here on Truth Frequency Radio, and I'm honored to have a special guest with us this evening, William Schneblin of One Accord Ministries. Brother William, are you there? I hope so. Can you hear me? I can, and I thank awesome. you for taking the time to join us this <laughs> evening. I know you're a a very busy individual and that you've got a lot going on yourself. And so uh, know that we greatly appreciate uh, the opportunity and the honor to share in fellowship with you. That's great. Glad to be here, Zen. Well, before we get started, I'd like to give you uh, opportunity to speak of your website and contact information. Uh, any projects uh, that you've lately released um, that you'd like to bring to light to the listening audience, anything of that nature? Well, yeah, sure. Um, our website is withoneaccord.org. It's not, you said one oh, accord. Sorry. With one accord. That's okay. It's a common, common mistake. Uh, withoneaccord.org. And uh, we can, you have, we have a newsletter you can sign up for, uh, the liberator. And, um, uh, it, it, both email versions and if you prefer a print version. Uh, we also have lots and lots of free material people can download on spiritual warfare, um, cult apologetics, Bible study, the Torah, um, and even prayers. We have like our deliverance prayers that we lead people through are available there for free download. We also have my six books available and dozens of DVDs on various topics from, you know, all manner of things, Mormons, Masons, spiritual warfare, uh, Torah, uh, you name it, we've got it. And um, the list is growing every day. We're just right now within a day or two of releasing our newest DVD teaching, which is called Churchcraft. Uh, the subtitle is um, Witchcraft, Christianity, and the End of Days. And uh, it's 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 pretty hot, I'll tell you. I mean, I'm, I can't wait to get it out to people. So all these things are available on our website with oneaccord.org, and we would certainly welcome people coming to check us out. Well, the DVD that you just mentioned certainly sounds fascinating, and I know that a lot of people uh, are familiar with your story and know that you have been involved in uh, for a very long time in all kind of esoteric subjects and um, all of us have great respect for you. I know that uh, you were one of the first um, to really bring some semblance of, of truth to the whole New World Order, the Masonic ties, um, to all of the uh, occultic hierarchies and the things that they were involved in, even with New Age teachings, and then bringing all of that and tying it to the prophetic word that um, most certainly you were one of the pioneers to speak about truth in that way. And I know that probably a lot of the people in the listening audience, like myself, were greatly impacted uh, early on in our studies, in our awakening um, by your testimony and the work that you've done. And so I want to thank you for that. And also, if you would, can you speak a little bit about each one of your uh, your books? Oh, surely. Well, the first book uh, we came out with was, um, the, I mean, two smaller books on Mormonism are now out of print. Uh, the, the brother that helped me produce them has passed away, gone home to be with the Almighty. Uh, Mormonism's Temple of Doom and uh, Wedded Sepulchers, but the first major book I did was Wicca, and that basically is my testimony of how I came out of white witchcraft, how I got born again, and also it's very much intended to be a, an evangelistic tool people can hand to a witch, uh, a white witch, you know, and I don't mean racially when I say that word, I mean someone who's a, a good witch, a Wiccan, <clears throat> and uh, it's, it's a very good book for that, and it also gives a basic primer on a biblical apologetic against the occult and especially against reincarnation, which is extremely popular nowadays in the New Age movement and, and various cults. So it's an important book in that sense, especially. 
Then we have Masonry Beyond the Light, which was my second major book. And many of you are kind enough to say it's the best book ever written on the subject of Freemasonry by a former Mason. And we talk about, you know, what is Masonry? What's the history of Masonry? Is it really just this benign, you know, fellowship of good old boys that do charitable works? Or is there something more sinister involved? And, of course, I was a Mason. I was a 32nd-degree Mason in the uh, Scottish Rite, and I was a 10th-degree Mason in New York Rite, and I was also a 90th-degree Mason in the Rite of Memphis Mitzrayim, which is a European branch of Masonry. <clears throat> and it also gives a strong biblical apologetic to, as to why a believer should never, never consider being a Mason and why if a believer is a Mason, they should get out of it as soon as possible renounce it formally before the throne of Yahuwah, and then send a letter to the lodge, the Grand Lodge of their state, asking that their name be taken off the rolls immediately. <clears throat> renounce the headship, too, the headship authority of the Grand Master of that state, wherever they are. Then we have um, Lucifer Throne, which uh, is kind of a bigger autobiography that takes people deeper into the occult, it talks about hardcore Satanism and my involvement with it, and it goes through the whole, uh, the whole narrative in a much deeper way. It talks about my involvement with Crowley, with the Church of Satan, with the Brotherhood, and with, with Thelema, which is Crowley's religion, and, and how all this ties together. And it also uh, has, again, <clears throat> spiritual warfare materials in it, about how to protect yourself from curses from these people, how to witness to Satanists, how to share Yahushua with someone who's a Satanist, whether they're a, they're a hardcore you know, Satanist or whether they're just like a member of the Church of Satan or a Satanic Temple Church type person. You know, and we can talk about what the distant, the difference is there between them. But that, and then it also has in the back, Lucifer's throne, a complete calendar of all the holidays of witchcraft and Satanism, so people can gear up. They can be forewarned. They can start praying. You know, like the, the next big one that's coming is Yule, which is around December 22nd or 23rd. Major witch holiday, major satanic holiday. <clears throat> okay, then we have Blood on the Doorpost, which is our, it's become our bestseller. It's our flagship book. It's about spiritual warfare and deliverance, and it's like at a graduate level of those subjects. Uh, it gets into how to set people free from the demonic, from any number of groups, you know, Jehovah Witnesses, witches, Masons, Mormons, Catholics, you name it. And uh, it also gets into to church-wide issues of, of how to pray for your church, how to come against these things, and just, just go forward, you know, with this stuff. It, you know, because the church, and that's part of what we talk about in this new DVD, too. The church has kind of an AWOL. It's kind of allowed the occult and secularism and witchcraft and the New Age to kind of roll over it. And it's it's losing the battle by default. And we can't let this happen. We cannot let this happen. We need to reclaim our nation and the world for the cross of Christ. That's what it takes. And this book, Blood on the Doorpost, will give you a lot of tools as to how to do that. And then we have Space Invaders, which is a book that I put out in the mid-90s about the UFO phenomenon and how that relates to fallen celestial beings, which I know an area you're familiar with, mm -hmm. and, and how it relates to end-time prophecy and, uh, you know, what, what really went on down in the Antarctic, what really went on in Roswell and, and some of these other, you know, touch points in the history of ufology. Many people don't know, but I have literally been involved heavily studying UFOs for a half a century. I started doing it around, you know, 1966. So uh, I bring a lot of knowledge and a lot of information to that topic. And then finally, uh, about three years ago, I wrote uh, Romancing Death, which is about the whole pop culture vampire occult phenomenon that was sweeping the media and still is to a degree on television and movies, the vampire thing, and, and why this stuff is dangerous. And it also gets into guidelines for, for entertainment, how to be set apart in your entertainment choices, both for yourself as adults, but especially for your teenagers and your young people. Because let's face it, right now we're in the middle of a major culture war, and the church has been losing it. 
and we need to turn that around. And there's a whole conversation we can have about that. But the main thing is you need to know how to protect your children and your family from these cultural uh, toxins of the occult, witchcraft, and also sexuality and violence and drugs that are seeping into your home through your television, through video games, through smartphones, you know, you name it. So that, that was our last book. And now I'm working on a sequel to Blood on the Doorpost, which is going to be a major spiritual warfare volume, um, if I can ever have the time to get it done. Hallelujah. So that's, that's what our books are all about. Well, uh, those are very important topics, and um, your focus on spiritual warfare uh, is also very necessary, especially in this day and age when kids in just loving watching the uh, paranormal activity and paranormal shows, ghost hunting shows, well, they're in hanging out and in, in gathering for parties where they break out the, the Ouija board and sit around the Ouija board and, you know, and it's all fun and games to them or in watching horror movies and sharing those kind of interests, then that opens them to involvement in the occult when they have no idea as to what they are getting themselves in, in or opening the doors to. And, um, and then they, in being possessed or getting lost, um, they have no idea where to go to get a guidance and direction and healing. And, uh, and so if you would, um, can you comment on that? Well, yeah. And the, the sad thing is, is that most churches won't touch this stuff. Right. If a parent has a child, and I, I will tell you this back when I, I, I studied to be a witch and a high priest and also a druidic high priest, you know, the druids. And I was told very clearly that the best way, for a person to get demon possessed is to play with a Ouija board. And witches actually stay away from it. Contrary to what you might see in the movies, a smart witch won't mess with a Ouija board because they understand the profound evil that's involved in that thing. And yet they're sold as toys. They're made right. by a toy company, Milton Bradley, that also made Monopoly and many other classic games. And it's sad. But you're right. I mean, and, and a lot of times if a parent has a child that, because things happen when you're a teenager. I mean, you have, you know, girls have slumber parties and they do seances or they do this levitation thing and, and they do Ouija boards and boys do that too. Uh, oddly enough, in all my storied years of being in the occult, I never once touched a Ouija board, ever. Wow. <laughs> Which is kind of funny when you think about it, but... That's because of the warning I got very early on by people I then respected. So it is a big deal. I mean, if you go to a seance or participate in a seance, it's a total open doorway for the demonic. Even if the child is born again, even if the child goes to church and has Christian folks, parents, you know, uh, this can totally infest your child, and you won't even know it until it starts growing like a Death Watch beetle within the, your little boy or your little girl or your teenager, and all of a sudden they start getting dark, they start getting, you know, weird choices in music or hair or wearing black and all this stuff, and you never know. I mean, this stuff can happen, let me tell you, even in the finest Christian homes, if they're not careful, what sort of stuff comes in through the um, through these games, through these um, video games too, by the way. I mean, the Ouija board is very, you know, early 20th century. But video games, many of them now, are steeped in the occult, uh, just totally given over to, to evil and sorcery and violence. I mean, whether it's stuff like Grand Theft Auto, whatever iteration we're on with that, or whether it's, you know, Dungeons and Dragons or World of Warcraft, or all these things, they all involve people having avatars where they're pretending to be sorcerers and wizards and, you know, Xena warrior princess type people. And it's, it's again, very seductive and very, very dangerous. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you as well uh, if you could comment on, like, um, Tarot and people playing around with crystals and, and things of that nature. Mm-hmm. 
Well, you know, yeah, tarot is divination. It's a form of, of fortune telling, certainly, and you need to keep away from that. Um, and of course, ditto with with like some people will use playing cards for the same purpose instead of the the fancier, you know, tarot cards, which is a different kind of card deck. They will use, you know, just the regular playing cards of fifty two cards for suits. Either way, it's divination and it's forbidden in the scriptures. You'll see that, you know, both in the Torah and also in in the New Testament. You'll see this kind of thing. Is it says that you know. People that do sorcery and necromancy and divination shall not inherit the kingdom, and they won't. It's that simple. And um, let's see, what was the other thing you mentioned? Uh, just crystals oh, and yeah, yeah, you know, crystal ball gazing, another form of divination. Uh, crystals themselves, and obviously, in and of themselves, crystals are just creations of, mm -hmm. of a father. But the trouble is they're given all these magical properties and gurus and mediums and trans channelers pray over them and they hand them out. Oh, this is going to make you find your boyfriend or your girlfriend, um, you know, this kind of thing. And that isn't good. Again, you're, 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 you're implying, you're empowering a, a creation with the power of a demon with the power of a false El, a false deity. And then you're expecting it to go out and do stuff for you. And that's a kind of witchcraft. When you, when in witchcraft, you can take a demon, or you might not call it a demon. If you're a white witch, you might just call it a spirit and put it into a rock or into a stone or into a bottle of fluid, like a fluid condenser, something like that. And you think you're doing a good thing, but actually you are giving that individual when you're giving it to them, something that is infested with demonic power. So again, we recommend as kind of basic spiritual warfare that you know you should just simply uh, pray over everything you bring into your home, your food, your beverages. I mean, if you go out and buy clothing or golf clubs, I don't care what it is, pray over it before you bring it in your home. We just say, may the blood of Yahushua the Messiah cover everything we bring into our home and everything that's in our lives. Every time we walk, we get out of the car and walk into the house. So there you go. You know, do things like that. It will drastically cut down on the amount of spiritual garbage you have to deal with in your home. Definitely. Absolutely. Uh, would you also recommend um, like, most certainly praying over your meals or even praying over uh, your beverages, what you're going to, you know, drinking water, uh, just offering a, a prayer just to ask the Most High to bless those kind of things, just anything you're taking into your body, even like oh. fruit or anything like that. Well, especially that because, I mean, when you think of all, uh, I mean, we, we try to eat organic, you know, uh, and we do almost all the time, but sometimes, you know, you're kind of stuck in a situation where you can't. But, yeah, we pray over all of our food. We ask Abba to bless and purify it in Yahushua's name. And yes, our beverages too. If we just sit down and have a glass of water or a cup of coffee together or, you know, whatever it might be, yeah, we pray over every single thing that goes into our bodies. We ask Abba Father to bless and purify it in Yahushua's name. And we thank him. We yeah. thank him for providing it. Yes, absolutely. I agree. I think that's a. A very good thing to do, and it also shows gratitude uh, to the Most High for just all the blessings and uh, you know, thanksgiving for um, all of what He provides for us in all the forms, uh, eating and, and drinking and uh, water, all that. It's just a it's huge blessing, and it just shows humble gratitude. Um, but I wanted to also ask you, as far as uh, some of these individuals, children, uh, teenagers, if they have um, gotten themselves involved playing around with Ouija boards or, you know, like they they think it's fun to go out to the graveyards and perform EVP sessions. And then if they find that they have something attached and they can't turn to their pastor or preacher or minister um, what would you recommend that an individual like that um, that has and, and notices these uh, spiritual attachments, what can they do um, besides 
you know, calling you and asking you for advice. <laughs> well, you know, we get so many calls like that, we can't really field them. We try, right. we try to get the ones we can, but that's why we wrote Blood on the Doorpost. That is a manual for this very sort of thing. And basically, assuming the child's a Christian, they were, you know, led to Moshiach at some point in their earlier life, um, they have authority over this stuff. But what they need to do is, and I would recommend going together with their parent, their mom or dad, or ideally both, and going through the prayers that we have on our website for deliverance. And because sometimes parents, okay, this is important, sometimes parents do not understand that even if they're lifelong believers, <clears throat> that they can bring in ancestral curses from their parents, their grandparents, and their great-grandparents that can percolate into, into their child and make the child more predisposed to this sort of evil influence. And that's right out of, you know, Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. It's right in the middle of the Ten Commandments. So they would probably be wise to pray these prayers with their child, as well as for their child. And, you know, take them through, and they would, we'd want the person to renounce, to, to repent, having done whatever they did, you know, whether it was a seance or Ouija board or whatever, uh, or, and also then, you know, renounce it and ask Abba Father to forgive it in the name of Yahushua the Messiah. And then command, second part, command any evil spirits that may have come into them because of this sort of activity. And there are things that I would suggest, like, for example, the spirit of divination, you know, uh, the deaf and dumb spirit, the spirit of rebellion, the spirit of witchcraft, you know, those sort of things. And again, all these evil spirits are listed in the appendix of Blood on the Doorpost. Uh, and we also think we have a list of them on our website, too. But anyhow, go through that and renounce all those evil spirits, and then in Yahushua's name, command those things to be bound together as one and weakened with the blood of Calvary, and <clears throat> command these evil spirits that you have named to go where Yahushua tells them to go by the voice of his Holy Spirit. And, you know, that normally ought to do it. And, of course, be sure if the child has any, and when I say child, it could very well be a teenager, any artifacts of this sort, like, you know, Ouija boards, excuse me, occult books, or paraphernalia, um, things of that nature, you need to get rid of those things. Burn them by fire, plead the blood of Yahushua over them, and get them out of the home, out of the child's room. Excellent. Um, before, when we come back from the first break, I'm going to ask you um, your opinion on this uh, this current election process. But before then, can you comment on in your book Lucifer Dethroned? You talked about how when you got at a very high level in Masonry and Satanism, a Luciferianism, that you were involved directly with a fallen angel. Can you talk about? the two paths as far as like vampirism and um, the werewolf and, and is that like, is that possibility for high level Satanists? Is that what they are really getting themselves involved in? Okay. And now or after the break, uh, let's, we can cover it now and then we'll finish okay. up after the break. Well, yes, yes. See, um, when you get high enough up in these groups, you, you start no, are no longer dealing with human beings. You're dealing with fallen celestial beings, fallen angels. And these are the beings that run the show behind the scenes of, of governments, of churches, yes, churches, uh, of, of all these different institutions within our society. And, you know, they're in the White House, they're in the Kremlin, they're in number 10 Downing Street. It doesn't matter. They are there trying their best to manipulate whoever is whoever is running that particular country or that particular area. And, yes, I had dealings with these beings. I mean, when I got to a certain level of the, um, and let's see, it would have been an adeptus um, major and then adeptus exemptus degree. I had to, to actually drink the blood of a fallen angel and you know things of that nature so yes these things are, are very real they reign over the areas of the world of the nations they reign over cities and states and organizations 
and that that is this hierarchy that we are in, we are engaged in, uh, and and of course these things are all fallen beings, and so they are enemies of the cross, they are enemies of the gospel, and that's why they have done their very best in the last generations or two generations or so to really turn America away from the Messiah, away from the scriptures, and towards all this creepy occult stuff. Was there another part you wanted to talk about? I lost um, track of a second. Well, no, that, that was good. But um, can you also answer, it, it? it's that involvement with these fallen angels, is that what gives people the ability to assume form as like a, a vampire or... Oh, yeah. Uh, and also a werewolf and you know, yes. shape shifting. Yeah, I would say so. In my case, as I said, I drank the blood of this fallen celestial being, and it enabled me to, yeah, go into those changes. I imagine a similar thing happens with a werewolf. All right, we'll be right back, everyone. All right, welcome back, everybody. Um, Doctor Bill, I'd like to give you a chance again to. Um, just elaborate a little bit on the comment that you were making before we went to break, just about the different abilities that they give you uh, in becoming involved with quality. Well, yeah, like, I mean, abilities might not be the right word. <laughs> They're almost liabilities, but it sounds real good. Like almost everything the devil gives you, it sounds really good at first, but then it goes south pretty fast and like in the case of my personal experience after I went through this thing with this fallen celestial being all I could eat was blood I couldn't eat food all I could eat was blood and Catholic communion wafers and hey Bill me that, yeah we're getting static on your side for some for some reason it was um echoing um huh. uh, and I'm uh, I guess they're hearing it in the chat room uh huh. Do well, you know I mean, I can uh, try to call you right back and see if we get a bigger, better line. Do you want to try that? Well, uh, I was getting some stuff coming in on my computer, and so I turned the sounds totally onto the uh, onto the headset that I'm using. I don't know if that, like you, there's also some tone on your end as well. Okay, maybe um, whatever you did that might have. Um, caused it but i'm not sure um i don't hear it right now but when you talk it, it does okay now like now it, it's a problem maybe um do the setting back to the okay all right okay uh hold on a minute okay no problem um uh, just a sec Okay, now how about that? Oh, yeah, that's much better. That's okay. interesting. I, I don't know why that would be. Are we getting... Um, anyhow, it's not that important. Okay. okay. Um, let's see. Oh, yeah. Well, um, you know, I'll tell you, the vampire diet, pardon the expression, sucks. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> right. it's monotonous. It's boring. I couldn't go out in the sunlight. Uh, plus, it's terribly, terribly addictive. Blood and occult power are two of the most addictive substances on earth. That's why our Heavenly Father tells us repeatedly in the Bible, you know, in, in you know, both in the Torah and with, you know, and also in the New Testament, we're not supposed to drink blood. So yeah, I mean, but I did get stronger. I did have an ability to, to see better in the dark. I, I was basically turning into a predator. And it wasn't fun at all. And that's why I was so grateful when Abba Father set me free from that. And with the the, um, the werewolf thing, I imagined something similar. I mean, I knew people that were werewolves. And they said it was a horrible, painful thing to go through, to turn into a werewolf. It was just awful. And and they, they would never recommend anybody to do it. So, you know, it, it's like everything the devil gives you. He thinks you're going to have all this power and you're going to be so cool and sexy and all of that and ends up all turning in the dust on your tongue so to speak it's all lies and it's all demons all of this stuff is done with demons i mean like the ability 
people dispute the fact that, oh, you can't turn into a wolf, you know, if you're a human being. Well, there's a lot of people, including many solid Christians, who have testified that they have seen this kind of thing happen, whether it's shape-shifting or skin-walking or lycanthropy, which is just a scientific term for a werewolf. Uh, it's real, and we go into great length in this in our book, Romancing Death. There's a whole section there on the phenomenon of the werewolf and how it works. It's basically a curse. It's totally a curse, and that's what it... But, yeah, you do get these sort of seductive powers from these fallen angelic beings. That is indisputable. But the price you pay for those powers is just terrible, both for yourself and for those who love you. It's like any other addiction. It starts out as heaven, quote unquote, and bliss and ecstasy, and before you know it, you're deep in the depths of hell. Yeah, I recall from your book that you... Uh, that it, you said uh, you were having difficulty as far as um, keeping away from the temptation to feed on blood. That's true. That's very true. And that because... this was going to drive you to commit a crime uh, that you didn't want to, you didn't want to go there and praise God you were set free prior to uh, succumbing. By one woman praying for me who I've never even met. She never has met me. She just decided to pray for me because she saw, you know, she was a bank officer out in Frisco and she saw that I was sending checks to the Church of Satan. And it totally demolished my life. So prayer is powerful in all of this. We never, ever, ever want to underestimate the power of prayer. But yeah, I was, I was struggling because, see, again, it's like any other addiction. If you're, if you're a heroin addict, you need more and more of the drug to get the same buzz. If you're an alcoholic, the same thing. You need to drink more and more, and you build up a tolerance to the substance. In the same way with blood and occult power, you need more and more to get the same kick. And as I discuss in my book, I had several women in the coven that I ran who were more than willing to let me bite them in the neck and drink their blood. So that helped for a while. But gradually it became not enough. And that's when I started, you were mentioning this temptation I was feeling when I was out in the wee hours of the morning working at a job. I, I would be driving around and I would see these, most of them were, you know, like street walkers or whatever. But I was really tempted to go and just attack them and drink their blood and rip their throat out. Yeah, praise God that you uh, were freed from all of that uh, prior to anything like that happening. Okay. But, yes. Um, and I want to, because Kathy had told me that you have, uh, and are very wise to um, what's going on as far as this election campaign. And so I wanted to spend a little bit of time speaking about that. And if you would, can you share some of your knowledge and your stance and where you are with what's going on right now? Well, okay. <laughs> This is the most extraordinary election I can remember in my lifetime, and as I'm, I'm nearly 70 years old. So it's been bizarre, and I think it's because it is literally a spiritual battle, much more so than any other recent election has been, and it's basically a battle for Christian culture, totally. And, you know... What I, what I see, I mean, obviously, Donald Trump is far from perfect. You know, I like to compare him to Samson. You know, a guy who's very powerful with a lot of hair that's very flawed. But Abba Father can still use him. Because let's face it, all of us are flawed. Some of us are more flawed than others. And would I rather that he was a more set-apart guy who, you know, kept the commandments and, you know, whatever you want to, you know, was really a great example of walking in the scriptures, but he's not. But he has, I think, what we need. And on the other hand, you look at the other side of the, of the aisle, so to speak, and I'll, I'll tell you this. I mean, way back in the 90s, I was warning people, I'm on record on radio shows and whatnot, that Hillary Clinton was then and still is a very high-level witch. She is an Illuminatus or an Illuminata, 
feminine, maybe. And, you know, and she's extremely powerful, extremely dangerous. And, you know, I think she's probably, probably the second most evil woman in the world. And the idea that she is that close to, you know, winning the White House is just absolutely terrifying for me. Because and here's why I say this is a battle for, for basically biblical civilization. I mean, the, the whole culture, I mean, as flawed as it is, the whole of Western society is based on the scriptures. Even though it's not perfect, it's still, if you look at the history of uh, how America came from England and, you know, we kind of build upon their idea of common law, of property rights, of, you know, people having freedom, and, and we made it even better over here in America after the revolution, and we set up the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, which is still a unique document. And no, it's not Christian per se, but it is a document that allows the body of Messiah to flourish and is also allowed for religious freedom and for an environment, which I personally, as someone of Jewish background, you know, the fact that it is, has allowed, it's been a place where for the most part, Jews have been free to live without fear of pogroms or persecution or Holocaust, things like that in America. And I think that's mainly why the Almighty has down through the decades blessed this nation. But I think we're kind of skating on thin ice in the last generation or so. And when you look at, at someone like, you know, Donald Trump, who has said he will defend the Constitution, he will defend the First and Second Amendments, because you can't have one without the other. I don't think, I think the idea of the right to keep and bear arms is a biblical right. You know, even Yahushua told, you know, the apostles at the end of his life, he said, okay, go sell your cloak and buy a sword. Right. You know, and I mean, today we'd say, okay, go sell your your overcoat and buy a, you know, a Glock or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, um, the point is, is that those are foundational things because we need to have freedom of religion, freedom of speech. We need to have guns to defend them. And Hillary is an enemy of both. And it appears, you know, that Donald Trump is a friend to both. He's also a friend of the unborn. He said he's going to put uh, Supreme Court justices on the uh, bench that are strict constitutionalists, and and that means pro-life, you know. And on the other hand, the two things that's, that are going to happen if, if Hillary wins this election, Yahoo forbid, is number one, she's going to let tens and hun probably hundreds of thousands of these Muslim immigrants into America. And this is changing the spiritual dynamic of our nation, not just the economy, not just the culture, uh, not just even the emotional health of the nation, but it's changing the spiritual nature of our nation because most of these people that are coming into our nation are, are bring with them not only foreign cultures, but foreign devils. They bring mm -hmm. in, you know, demons, whether they're, they're Shinto demons or Buddhist demons or Muslim demons or whatever they might be, you know, they, they're, they're bringing these people in. At the same time, the church has gotten less and less effective at witnessing and at being intercessors and doing spiritual warfare. I mean, there's, there's a small, you know, kind of like a spiritual Marine Corps, uh, special ops of believers, of which we try to be the, some of the people that are guiding them, the, that are really, really praying and doing warfare against this. But the vast majority of Christians are asleep at the switch, and they don't understand, in terms of the election, these, these never-Trump people that are trying to be all prissy and good conservatives and say, oh, well, his, his attitude on trade isn't quite perfect, or he's, he's only been a conservative for a few years, and oh, blah, blah, blah. They don't realize the, the alternative is literally apocalyptic. I mean, if Hillary gets elected... You're going to, first of all, see the Supreme Court totally be given over to socialism, progressivism, and, you know, the, the loss of any possible restriction on abortion, the loss of rights of guns and freedom of religion. And you're also going to see this huge wave of people that are foreign to our culture that do not believe in Christian ideals or American ideals. And they're not going to vote 
in favor of those things. They're going to vote for the big, huge welfare state. That's what they're going to vote for because that's what they, uh, many of them are coming from. And they, you know, it used to be like, I, I don't know about you, but my, my, let me think, the, 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 the great grandparents came here from Ireland and from Europe. And they came here and they came here because they knew there was opportunity here. They didn't come here because we had welfare because back then nobody had welfare. They came here because they knew they could find a better life and they believe in the ideals of America. The people that are coming here today are doing so because number one, they want free stuff. And number two, I don't mean to tar everybody because I know there's always exception to these things. But number two, they're coming because a lot of them hate America. They hate biblical values. They hate everything about us and they want to destroy us through terrorism, through subversion, through Sharia law. Okay, um, all that being said, Hillary herself is a devil worshiper in a, in a way that is, you know, not been true, I don't believe. I mean, some of these other people like the Bushes are very dark and very deep into the Illuminati and, you know, and other people probably down through the years as well, but nobody to the extent that, that uh, Hillary Clinton is. So there, there's all this stuff. You know, and like I said, I've been warning about her being a cultist and a witch for, you know, like 30 years. But here's the point I think we need to make. Things are coming out in in these WikiLeaks things and whatnot. Because let me step back for one moment and say something that everybody here should understand. Most people that have the IQ of a turnip know that emails are not secure. That if you send something through an email, you might as well assume other people can read it, right. whether it's the NSA or whether it's hackers or whoever it might be. They're reading your email, okay? And so you have these things coming out about the this Podesta guy and his brother who, and, you know, Podesta is basically Hillary Clinton's right-hand guy. He's the head of her campaign manager being involved in these creepy satanic rituals. And, of course, people on the left are trying to downplay this stuff. But they don't know Thelema and Crowley and all this stuff the way I do. And Or maybe they do, and they're just lying their lips off. But the point is, this stuff, like this, this spirit cooking, which is now flaming on the Internet. I mean, everybody's you know going crazy about it. It's basically a form of Crowleyan magic. And Crowley was, was a Satanist from the last century, he died in 1947, and he was, I'm sure a lot of your readers or listeners are familiar with him, but basically he believed he was the great beast, Tomegatherion, and he even changed his name so it would add up to 666, you know, the number of the beast. And he started his own religion that was called Thelema, which is the Greek word for will, and his, his kind of golden rule was, do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law, Love is the law, love under will. Now, this lady, this creepy uh, Marina Abramovich, and I don't know for sure how she pronounces her last name, but she's this occult, quote-unquote, performance artist. And, you know, she just does bizarre things, and she has these spirit cooking parties where they, they immerse uh, people in blood and semen and um, mother's human mother's milk, and uh, just all kinds of creepy stuff. They're into mock, they're pretending to be, I hope they're pretending to be cannibals. They're pretending to eat human fingers in these rituals. They're pretending to cut off parts of people and eat them. And, you know, they try to say, oh, well, this is just performance art. And this woman, this Marina Abramovic, whatever, however she says it, she, um, she said that when we do these things in an art gallery, it's art. Yeah, right, you know, anyhow. But if we do it in a private setting, like at a party at somebody's home, then it's an occult ritual. And that's what this uh, John Podesta and his brother were invited to. Now, we can't prove they went. But here, here's the point I want to make. If this kind of stuff is, and this stuff is photographed. I mean, there are photographs all over the internet now because, of course, nowadays everybody has smartphones with cameras in them. Right, and there's right. pictures of these rituals and of, of, a, of a 
it's you know a, a, I hope it's a mannequin of a woman floating in a thing of blood and menstrual fluid and, and they're cutting her stomach and doing weird things and you know all this bizarre stuff and it's nuts it's absolutely nuts and if this is and if this is what they're doing for the public what are they doing in private right you know that's the question I would have now now here's the thing to understand this this thalamic religion of Crowley was started in 1904, so it's like 110, 115 years old, somewhere in there. And basically, he claims that he got this communication from this spirit being named Iwas, um, and it's a whole long story, which I won't go into, but the bottom line is they were, he and his wife were on their honeymoon in Cairo, his first wife, and um, anyhow, she went into a trance, and told him that someone wanted to communicate with him. And she pointed to an Egyptian artifact in the Egyptian in the Cairo Museum, and he looked at it, and it was a, a, what's called a stele, which is like an, it's like kind of like a, almost like the pictures you see like in the Ten Commandments movie of one of the tables of the Ten Commandments. It's like a, a thing of rock that's shaped kind of like one of those two tablets that you see Charlton Heston holding. And it had a bunch of, and it represented this guy, Ankaf Nankonsu, who was a priest in ancient Egypt. And the number of the exhibit cataloged in the museum was number 666. Oh, wow. And Crowley thought, this is it, this is it, you know. So they went back to the hotel, and this, his wife went into trance, and this being came through her and dictated this book, Liber Al Vellagis, which is Latin for the Book of the Law. And basically, it's like this three-chapter diatribe. First of all, it, it's a praise of ancient paganism and magic in Egypt. But then the last two chapters, especially the third one, are a diatribe against Christianity and against all of the virtues that Yahushua you know, taught us to cultivate in our lives. And here's what I want to talk about. There are prophecies in this book. And I have every reason to believe that the Clintons are Thelemites because they act like Thelemites. Their, their ethical system is like Thelemites. And one reason I say that, and it's come out very recently, that, that both Bill and now maybe even Hillary are involved in this orgy island and this Lolita right. Express, this um, jet that this pervert guy Epstein owns that he flies people to his private island to have sex with underage, underage children. And that's part of this Crowley thing. He talks about his religion, his new religion, is the religion of Horus, the crowned and conquering child. And I did teaching about this way back in the early 90s called Evil Communications. You can still buy it on our website as a DVD now, about how the whole Crowleyan magical thing that he opened up, because he did all of these workings where he would open up doorways, portals, into these dark dimensions and unleash pedophilia into the environment, especially through the channel of Freemasonry, the unleashed pedophilia into the environment. And, you know, because this kind of stuff in the West, at least, was not talked about, was not approved, was not in any way done until really the last, you know, 150 years or so. And it's partly because of this man Crowley and his influence and his the magical way in which he has kind of fouled the streams of the mainstream culture and there have not been enough people praying against it. There have not. The idea of the fascinating child, uh, the cult of the fascinating child, the cult of the crown and conquering child, I'll tell you, it's all there. I mean, the sexualization of little children, you know, little children being in, in beauty contests, and, and I mean, it's just disgusting. You know, little mm -hmm. children that are under the age of four or five years old should not be sex objects. But right, yet right. they are. And that's what this, this stuff is tending to cultivate. Now, here, here's what I want to get to. This book, that the Thelemites regard as Scripture, the book of the law, in chapter 3, verse 23 through 25, because they have, just like you're reading the, 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 the Scriptures, and this is, this is their sacramental instruction, okay? Pardon me for reading this. I'll try and censor out anything that's grotesque, but... This being, this Iwas who dictated this book through Crowley's wife said, for perfume, 
makes honey and oil and thick leavings of red blood, then oil of abramelin and olive oil offered, afterwards softened and smoothed down with rich, fresh blood. Next verse, the best blood is of the moon monthly. Then the fresh blood of a child or dropping from the host of heaven, then of enemies. Then the priest or of the wor then of the priest or of the worshippers, last of some beast, no matter what. Verse 25. This burn of ye make cakes and eat ye unto me. This also has another use. Let it be laid before me and kept thick with perfumes of your oriasin, that means prayers, and it shall become full of beetles, as it were, and creeping things that are sacred unto me. These slay, slay, naming your enemies, and they, your enemies, shall fall before you. Now, isn't that just wonderful? Wow. Now, that's kind of what this, this Marina Abramovic is doing. I mean, she's creating sacramental rituals of, of menstrual blood and human blood and semen and Yah only knows what else that we don't even want to know. That's what she's doing. And then these people and... Probably this John Podesta, and I wouldn't be surprised if Hillary was doing this kind of stuff as well, are consuming these sacramental elements. Now, notice what's there at the end. These slay, naming your enemies, and they shall fall before you. They are, And we know this, that there are witches and Satanists trying to curse Donald Trump and his family and his campaign. And even though they're trying to say, oh, well, this is just art. This is just performance art, you know, like whatever the other forms of bizarre art that are out there mm -hmm. yeah there's always something deeper to it all right we'll be right back everyone buddy for second hour a really quick quote moreover this was not enough for them that they erred in the knowledge of god but whereas they lived in the great war of ignorance those so great plagues they called peace for whilst they slew their children in sacrifices or used secret ceremonies or made revilings of strange rites, they kept neither lives nor marriages any longer undefiled, but either one slew another traitorously or grieved him by adultery. Uh, Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 14. I wanted to ask you, because um, we were speaking about how, even like with the cremation of care, how it is said to be done in mock um, ceremony, but according to the Franklin cover-up and the eyewitness testimony of Paul, one of these children that were victimized by these different politicians, he mentions in his diary, and he had a photographic memory, of being taken towards where there were these very large trees, and we know that to be Bohemian Grove, and he mentions um, being witness to the person that he went up there with being murdered and then they he and another boy being forced to uh, involve themselves in necrophilia with this particular dead boy and that they dropped his body out of a helicopter to the uh, guys that were um, garbed in black robes down below and so you know, well, it seems to be that there is most certainly something more going on, and even in what you had mentioned. Well, yeah, and of course, you know, many high-level politicians, unfortunately, both Republican and Democrat, have been, you know, implicated in, as going out there uh, to this Bohemian Grove uh, ceremony you're describing, and uh, supposedly it's all just, you know, fake child sacrifice but yeah I, I don't i mean i was never in the bohemian grove but i i have my grave doubts about it uh one other thing from the chat room you had mentioned um that hillary was the second most evil woman were you referring to the queen previous to her uh yes <laughs> okay that's what i thought good old queen bess <clears throat> Uh, one last comment, and then I wanted to go into a different area of um, a different topic. But can you mention Alice Bailey's 10 point plan and how that is also tied to what is become the corruption and um, just the twisting of American culture, the destruction of the family, 
and all of that leading us to where we are now. Well, before I go there, I, there was something else I wanted to discuss Please. about this this creepy stuff with this um, uh, Hillary and this Marina Abramovic and whatever. In this same book, in the same chapter of the book, there is another prophecy. And I'm going to kind of skip through parts of it because a lot of it is just kind of bizarre. But uh, in verse 46, this hawk-headed you know, Elohim of vengeance, Horus, Rehur Kuit says, I am the warrior lord of the 40s. The 80s cower before me and are abased. I will bring to you victory and joy. I will be at your arms in battle, and you shall delight to say. And, and then it goes on, and in verse 48 it says, and this is all related to the scarlet woman, who's like the main consort of the beast in, in Crowley's thing, and he, he knew the Bible well. It said, in verse 49, I'm sorry, I am in a secret fourfold word, the blasphemy against all gods of men. Curse them, curse them, curse them. With my hawk's head, I peck at the eyes of Jesus he hangs on the cross. I flap my wings in the face of Muhammad and blind him. With my claws, I, care, I tear out the flesh of the Indian and the Buddhist, the Mongol and Din. Uh, you know, and then it just goes on. Let Mary and Violet be torn upon wheels for her sake. Let all chaste women be utterly despised among you. And this is, this is what's going on here. This is the root of what these people believe. And here's the point. The prophecy is, I am the warrior lord of the 40s. The 80s shall cower before me. Now, I don't know if there's anything to this or not, but both Bill and Hillary were born in the 40s. Okay? okay. Bill Clinton came to power as the governor of Arkansas in 1983. So in the 80s, he began to rise. And in the 90s, of course, he became president. And his presidency was, was defiled by his, his own issues, you know. And, of course, that's so bizarre because, you know, the guy is obviously a sex addict, a sex pervert, whatever word you want to use. And that's the core of this Crowley thing is the idea of the worship of sex, the, the orgies and perversion. I mean, Crowley was bisexual. He, you know, he boasted about killing 150 babies a year, male children. I mean, you know. And, and that's kind of what's going on here, you know, at the very least, pedophilia. Mm -hmm. So it's important to understand that, that they have these ceremonies in Crowley's religion called the Gnostic Mass and the Mass of the Phoenix, and that these things are very similar to what this woman is doing. And this, these, these people that are attending this are like the elites of New York society, the swells, you know, the people that are, you know, on top of this pinnacle of, of evil power. Like, again, uh, you know, these associates of Hillary Clinton. And I think we need to be aware that not only is this woman uh, apparently a criminal of the First Order, but she's also a, a devil worshiper. She really is. And she has no business being within a mile of the White House. Yeah, I fully agree. Um, and I recently I've heard of some of these things like um, – these human hunting parties where they um, keep the, 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 the phalluses of the young boys that they hunt down as trophies. Um, and also like with the Stanley Kubrick, the eyes wide, um, eyes wide shut, uh, the same kind of thing that it's an introspection. It gives us uh, insight into the kind of perversions that they are involved in. And also, with the connection to murder and um, uh, the disappearance of those that, you know, go against their orders. Yes, yes. That's, I mean, th this isn't just in New York. I mean, you know, when I was involved in Satanism, I never got high enough to go to it, but there was a big mansion in the suburbs of Chicago where these same kind of things that you see alluded to in Eyes Wide Shut were going on, all manner of, of debased sexual magic and rebels by the powerful and the elite, you know, including the reigning cardinal of the Catholic Church was involved in this stuff. At the time, I don't know about today, but back in the, in the 70s he was. Uh, I recently just saw something also about um, some individual that started like a Fifty Shades of Grey 
club um, for the elites and that they have to pay like ten to fifty thousand dollars to be part of these um, gatherings where they're doing that exact thing. So it's not even that it's being hidden or um, clandestine anymore. It's all, you know, open and in your face. You mean sadomasochistic type stuff? Yes, uh huh. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Very, uh, very thick stuff. The fact that, that that novel is such a huge bestseller among women. Right. Women, 50 million women bought that book. And I know it's now got several sequels and they're coming out with a new movie. I mean, the second one, the first one was horrible. I didn't go see it, but, you know, I heard it was terrible. And, you know, it, it's all perversion. Perversion. It's not exactly. any way, shape, or form spiritually or emotionally or physically healthy. Right. And the people that don't even read are buying and reading that entire series. Um, some of the girls that work around here uh, that work for me because I have a disability and they different girls work for me as caregivers, but some of them don't even read and they are fully enthralled with those particular books. It's, it's crazy. But um, anyways, uh, I would like to steer the conversation in this next hour towards your recent um, investigation, examination, and interest in the circle of the earth and the vaulted dome of the earth, um, because this is something that is still relatively new. I don't think you've done, um, I know you've released a, a few videos where you spoke about this, but um, there is a lot of great interest in this now, and most certainly I do believe it to be uh, biblically uh, affirmed within the scriptures, um, most specifically that the earth is not moving. Uh, and so no matter what people think of the shape of the earth, um, that it certainly is in no way moving, as is verified by the scientific experiments, the SAGNAC experiment, Aries failure, Michelson, Morley, Gale, uh, these four experiments which were done by heliocentrists to test the rate of the so-called spin um, of the earth and discovering that there was no motion it absolutely aligned with and um, confirmed the veracity of those many scriptures which in the bible say that the earth is in no way moving can you comment on this bill <laughs> well that's a big a big topic but yeah i mean i um for one thing, what, I guess what started me on this is decades ago when I was in the Illuminati, they made it very clear to me that the moon landing was a total hoax. So that really shattered me at the time because I was a big, you know, ast astronomy nerd and NASA nerd, and I loved all this stuff. I mean, my parents let me stay up and watch the the supposed moon landing in 1969, and it was one of the great moments of my young life. And um, and I couldn't believe it at the time, but yet when I looked into it, I saw all the reasons why, okay, th this just couldn't be. You know, we couldn't have really gone to the moon. And, and yet, you know, you asked like probably 99 out of 100 people, and I don't know what the figures really are, but most of you, oh, yeah, we went to the moon. And anybody that thinks that we didn't go to the moon is like a tinfoil hat person, you know, a conspiracy nut. You know, right. the funny thing is, is especially as the last year has shown us, you know, and the political side of things is that almost every conspiracy theory that these quote unquote conspiracy nuts like Alex Jones were talking about, they're all coming true. Right. They're all coming true. And, you know, it's 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 just amazing. But in any event, so that was the beginning of it. And of course, I when I got born again, I came out of a bunch of cults that so started with the Catholic Church. And then, you know, spiritualism and then Mormonism, these are all, you know, quasi-biblical faiths, okay? Forget about the witches and the Satanists for all. But both Catholics and spiritualists and Mormons all claim to be following the Bible, okay? Understand? So anyway, when I got saved out of Mormonism, which was my last step on the cult express train, um, I told myself, you know, I am going to follow the truth, the scriptural truth wherever it leads me. Amen. And that became my guiding 
my guiding light for the next, and that was in 1984, so really the next 30-some 30, 30 years. And, you know, as I was going along, I kept remembering the word, oddly enough, it was something a Mormon prophet said, Gordon B. Hinckley of all people, but he said <clears throat> that, you know, when you read he said the scriptures, and by that he meant the Book of Mormon, the Bible, the Doctrine and Covenant, the Pearl of Great Price, of course. He says it's like drinking water from a pure mountain stream. But when you read the words of men speculating about the scriptures, it's like drinking that pure water after the cattle have walked through it. <laughs> and, you know, I, I even to this day, I think that, you know, they say even a broken clock can be right twice a day. <laughs> and even a Mormon prophet can be right you know, once in a great century. And that's very true because as, as set apart, supposedly as righteous as some of these commentators are on the scriptures, they all try to tweak them to fit the modern flow of society. Right. And, you know, the biggest example of that to me is the fact, as you mentioned, the Bible very clearly presents a, a geocentric, in other words, the Earth is the center of, of the universe uh, cosmology, <clears throat> which, of course, right then and there just destroys astronomy. It destroys astrophysics, and it destroys all of the bases of the space program. And, you know, and also I think it also, the Bible is pretty clear, I mean, beyond any reasonable argument, that, that the Earth is also flat. You know, and I I have challenged people to tell me because oh man, I mean I know I mean I kind of <laughs> you know I kind of got lured out of the closet on this by Rob Skiba because he came out about this of course over a year ago now, and uh, and like him I just got a whole firestorm of people coming after me including losing donors and people attacking me and saying I was a I was part of a psyop and, you know, all this stuff. And okay, fine, you know, they can think what they want. I am following the truth, the truth of the scriptures wherever it leads. Yes, and, yes. and whatever realm it is, that's where I'm going. But, you know, what I tell people is this, because I know I've had several colleagues in the ministry that I respect saying, oh, you know, Brother Bill, this just is nonsense and you're making your ministry look funny and this is just stupid and I always take them back to Proverbs 18, 13. You know, right, he right. that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is a folly and a shame to him. And I didn't look into this real deeply until, you know, I started reading, you know, uh, Rob Skiba's material. And then I, I really dug into it. And, you know, to this day, I would tell anybody, you show me one scripture where the, the, um, the earth is described as being a globe. Show me what, and there isn't one, because right. I've read the Bible through thirty times, not specifically looking for that word. But I mean, all I have to do is go to a, a Strong's Concordance and look, and the word globe does not appear. The word ball does in Isaiah, but it has nothing to do with the 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 the, the shape of the earth. It's it's a totally different context. And when in Isaiah, you know, you know, talks about you know he. Per, the Almighty presides over the circle of the earth, that doesn't prove the earth is a globe. It just approves, proves that the earth is a circle. And a circle is not a globe. Any more than a square is a cube. You know, it's the difference between plane geometry and three-dimensional geometry. And anybody, I would think, with a high school degree would understand that. But, you know, we live in an age where people just kind of follow like sheep wherever the culture takes them. And, you know, I just, you know, it's like, you know, well, let me just say this, you know, people, uh, I think part of the problem is people have made an idol of science. Yes. And, and you know, we have been warned, you know, like you go to, you know, in Romans 3, 4, you know, let Elohim be true, but every man a liar. And if Yahweh says one thing, and Mr. Scientist, like Neil deGrasse Tyson or Bill Nye the Science Guy, contradicts Yahuwah, then Neil and Bill can just go walk off the edge of the nearest pier because they're full of it. They're absolutely full of it. And the other thing I tell people is, 
is that we have been brought up to think of science as this wonderful, absolutely, you know, objective, towering, you know, pinnacle of human knowledge. Well, here's the problem. First Timothy 6.20, he taught, Paul warns, he says, Oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babbling. You want to know what that means? Look at any science show on, you know, Discovery <laughs> Channel. And the opposition of science, falsely so-called. Now, isn't it interesting that the King James translators chose to use the word science? Because the Greek word there that's used in, in Greek is gnosis. And I was a Gnostic bishop, so I know very well what gnosis means. Gnosis is the idea that we are saved by secret knowledge. And my point, and I presented this in this YouTube video I did, that the scientists are Gnostics because they believe they are like this, this technological priesthood, okay, of, of all of this arcane knowledge that us poor peons don't can't possibly understand. We can't understand celestial mechanics, we can't understand, you know, calculus. We can't understand string theory and quantum physics. We're just the lowly people that pay their bills. Because most of these scientists are funded by the government. We all know how trustworthy the government is. Right. So anyway, they believe that these elite forms of knowledge that they possess will save us and will save them. And then if you look at what science has done, yeah, we've gotten a lot of neat stuff out of science. We've got, you know, computers, we got automobiles, we've also got nuclear bombs, we've got germ warfare, we've got biological warfare, we've got the whole planet is turning into a vast cesspool of, of toxic chemicals, you know, and the food is hardly fit to eat unless you go out of your way and spend a lot of money to buy organic food. Mm -hmm. So anyway, science is not as great as people think it is. And the thing that I warn people about is when scientists use their supposed knowledge to oppose scriptural truth, because science lies, and it lies a lot. And here's some yes. examples. Science lies about evolution. And here's the funny thing. Most serious Bible students believe that evolution is true, that, that creation and how they may not, they may disagree about whether it's a young earth or an old earth. You know, that's, that's sort of secondary, but they almost all of them believe that evolution, pardon me, evolution is false and that we were created as the book of Genesis chapter one and two says. So they will take all the material, you know, these wonderful people like uh, Ham and Ken Hovine and some of these other, you know, men who are great giants in, in American and Western Christianity who are fighting the good fight for the creation paradigm, you know, they all will say, oh, you can, all these textbooks lie. They just throw them out, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and if they'll turn around and say, oh, but these textbooks on astronomy, you can trust those. Right. You know, and that to me, that's not sensible. I mean, if you if you can throw out the, uh, the biology textbook because evolution contradicts the scriptures, and it also contradicts science, by the way, then... You know, why can't you throw out the astronomy textbooks? Because the astronomy textbook con con contradict the Bible. To me, that's not that's not a, a tenable position to hold. And I know for one thing, Kent Hovind, who I have a great deal of respect for, but he is very much against the flat earth. Right. So science lies about cancer. We're told all sorts of lies about the cause and the cures of cancer. In fact, we yes. have a whole DVD about that, cancer wars. Science lies about climate change. We know that the, the, the whole thing about global warming, which now they've had to change this climate change, is a total bag of nonsense. And yet they're still promoting it. Science lies about vaccines. They tell us, oh, these vaccines are perfectly safe. And yet, you, you know, so many kids, again, we have another DVD about that called Vaccine Wars, where we document how hundreds and hundreds of little children have been given horrible diseases, autism, you know, brain disorders, all kinds of stuff through vaccines, how many adults have been killed with, with flu vaccines, and how many young girls, and now they're trying to push it on boys too, that have had this, 
papilloma, human papilloma virus vaccine. I think it's Gardasil. How mm-hmm. how they get horror? They even die. They get brain damage in these young girls that are not even you know they're barely even twelve or thirteen years old when they get the shot and they're dead mm-hmm. or they're they're brain damaged. They're terribly brain damaged. Paralyzed. And yeah, paralyzed. And yet science, you know, science lies about it. Science lies about the unborn. We're told, oh, it's just a blob of tissue. It's not really a person. It's just a blob of tissue. That's a lie. That's an absolute lie. That that fetus has different DNA than the mother. The mother is just its host. Mm-hmm. You know, she's growing it within her womb, and that's a miracle. And hallelujah, thank Yahweh for mothers. But, you know, that isn't part of her. It's a unique human being. Science also lies about mental illness and psychiatric drugs. We have a whole DVD on that called Medical Murder. And then finally, science lies about childhood disorders like ADHD. They try to pump drugs into young children, especially boys, just because they want to be boys. I mean, boys are boisterous. That's why it's called boisterous. I mean, that's stupid, but I mean, I'm making a joke. (laughs) You know, I mean, boys will be boys. That's why we've had that expression in our society for two or three hundred years. Yes. I mean, these people are trying to turn boys into girls by giving them shots and chemicals and vaccines. And it's amazing that more of these young people, and they sometimes they do it to girls too, they just destroy these young people's lives for nothing except control. So Mm -hmm. if you look at all, I mean, these are some of the major issues that our world is confronted with. Some of the major issues, and science is lying to us about that. But if we're supposed to believe they're telling the truth about the nature of the world in which we live in. that's That's not feasible. Yeah, especially when, I mean, just looking at the Genesis timeline, do you have the heavenly luminaries not even being created until the fourth day, and then they're placed into the firmament of the earth above, um, below the vaulted dome, and inside the firmament of the earth? And how it is that you know you can uh, believe that the earth was just out there, and then all of a sudden the sun's made on the fourth day, then it's placed in orbit around it doesn't make any sense at all. Well, not only that, if you look at it, uh, the earth was created in Genesis 1-1. Yes. And then we we're told vegetation was created in Genesis 1-11, and then the sun and moon were created several verses later in verse 14. Right. But, you know, and how was, you know, totally different. All right, welcome back, everybody, for final segment. Um, Bill, I know that you are really busy with all that you are involved in, uh, and you probably haven't really even had a whole lot of time to investigate this uh, topic in you know as much as you might want. But can you tell us about some of the things that you've learned that convinced you that to be open to it as possibility, and that in examining it um, is somewhat that. There seems to be substance to it. Well, um, actually, I have spent a fair amount of time. There was a period there where I was virtually spending every waking moment, free moment, wow, that I was really? involved in ministry, uh, looking into this stuff. And That's I'm, awesome. I'm familiar, you know, like with some of the science experiments that were done. I mean, you mentioned a couple of them. Uh, you know, the, the I can't think of the fellow's name where they did the thing with the canal over in, in England that was, uh, you know, so long. And they, because the, the whole idea. Robotham. Right. The whole idea of the, um, the curvature of the earth. I mean, the fact that that's not really evident. You know, I mean, you walk outside, and I live in a very flat part of the country. And you walk outside and, and you look around, like if you're in the middle of Iowa. You know, you can see for miles and miles and miles. And, you know, I mean, I mean, there, there's a joke, you know, I'm friends of mine who are in Nebraska. They say Nebraska is so flat, you can see the top of your own head, you know, the bottom, the back of your head. You know, <laughs> of course, that assumes that the earth is round, but it's not. And, you know, so the fact that these people could go and, you know, um, 
sail a boat down this canal and presumably the water is the same depth and all of that and they both had like the, the telescope and flags and they were and they were observing how you, this guy could go and go and go for well over I forget how many miles, and it wasn't the flag, the appearance of the boat was not really going down. What do you do with something like that? Or or the famous thing of this guy that took the picture of the Chicago skyline from across right. the Michigan. And I mean, it's, oh, well, that's a mirage, blah, blah, blah. Well, that has also been debunked because there's some sharp people working on this. I mean, I don't agree with, I, I, there's a lot of stuff Eric Dubé is promoting now I'm not really in agreement with, but he's done a lot of great work in terms of the, the flat earth business, and obviously Rob Skiba and some others, and I know you have too, and it's just crazy, you know, all the stuff that's out there, if you just take off the blinders and look at what's around you, I mean, the fact that it's plain that the sun is going, is moving, the earth isn't moving. And especially when you realize the Bible says that. The Bible says that the sun is moving. Yes. The Bible says that the moon is moving. Uh, you know, and that the earth does not move. And if Yahweh's word says that, I believe that that settles it. Amen. And if science contradicts it, then science can go, you know, take a walk <laughs> off the short pier. Right. Yeah, I agree with you. And those were two very relevant points for me as well that, uh, you can confirm yourself, just like with Rob going up there to the Great Lakes and uh, confirming Joshua Nowicki's photo that that Chicago was not a mirage and that you can see it from 60 miles out and then drive to it in a boat uh, as he you know, did in um, verified in video forum, which all that is still being released. Uh, but the fact that you can see lighthouses at uh, well in extent of what they tell us is possible with the supposed curvature of the earth um, being proportionate to the, uh, as far as the miles and the inverse of it squared, uh, eight inches per mile, um, it, it shows that most certainly there is no curvature. Being able to see cityscapes, skylines, uh, the Statue of Liberty at 60 miles out, uh, lighthouses, at um, the 60 miles, 50 miles, um, they can see Oahu from Kauai in Hawaii at o in an extent of over 100 miles. Um, Cuba from uh, Miami. I mean, things like that. Absolutely, people see these things every day, and it most certainly affirms that there is no curvature. And then, if you just go to the ocean at the beach and you look out at the horizon and the way that the waters are perfectly flat and often very still, um, it lets you know that the earth is flat and it's also motionless. I mean, these things can be visually affirmed and also scientifically through experiments uh, verified. And they do confirm the postulations that are put forth by the biblical narrative. And so I'm in agreement with you um, that... I will stand with God and his word more so and over that of any scientist and anybody, uh, and even a, a theologian like uh, Kent Hovind who believes and has debunked evolution, but then, you know, wants to support the whole other side of it as far as the astronomical NASA, um, you know, that whole part of the scientific postulation, the heliocentrism. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, and you know the thing, the thing to bear in mind is people say, oh, well, this is divisive. You know, you're causing division. You know, within the movement, division within the body of Mashiach. Well, you know, Yahushua said, "I have come not to bring peace, but a sword." Yes. He went contrary to popular belief. He wasn't Mister Lovey Dovey. And <laughs> what people, I, I know, Rob Skiba, bless his heart, he brings this up a lot. But he says people don't understand that the idea of a globe strikes to the, and, and a, a, a heliocentric model of the universe, the cosmos, strikes to the very heart of the book of Genesis. Yes. It strikes to the very heart of it. And, you know, if, if the first book of the Bible is not true, then why should the second or the tenth or the sixtieth book of the Bible be true? Exactly. You know, 
And that's the problem, is that if you, you are promoting a cosmology that calls into question the word of Yahuwah, then you are basically, frankly, a heretic. Right. And most of these scientists are heretics. And, and many of them, as, as has been pointed out by other people, and I'm sure you, you've done it yourself, a lot of these astronomers are, are secularists, they're atheists, and a lot of the whole NASA community are originally they were a lot of Nazis and, and Freemasons, and like every astronaut that walked on the moon is a Freemason. I mean, this stuff is not good because all of these guys lie. I mean, Freemasons lie. I mean, you know, atheists lie, occultists lie. And that's 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 what the problem is. I mean, the very word NASA is similar to the Greek word, or probably a Hebrew word for deception. Yes. <laughs> is that a coincidence? Maybe, maybe not. No. Uh, <laughs> um, yes, and uh, also, you know, one of the things that I get in having um, brought and stood with this as truth and uh, shared it in my work is that so many people ask me, you know, well, what does it have to do? with salvation and in writing this book and doing the research in this area for the last two years and i've written two books on it now i've learned that you know basically the darwinian heliocentric worldview which has been put forth and established as um fact and taught in the educational systems this is the number one um belief that has driven so many of our children away from belief in the scriptures, belief in God, a belief that we were made in the image of God, that that the earth is special, and that um, and has taught them and got them to buy into that we evolved of monkeys and that there are all these millions of earths out there that just randomly, because of being in the Goldilocks zone, that that's the reason why they evolved life rather than life being created as special um, by the Most High God, and that, in my opinion, it's also leading to, which you said you wrote a book about the alien deception, I do believe that part of the strong delusion and the next aspect of this Darwinian heliocentric lie is that the ancient aliens are our creators, and that so many people are being groomed for this as part of the strong delusion because of the Darwinian heliocentric um, lie that has been perpetuated and which everybody has been indoctrinated into. And so in my mind, it's absolutely a salvation issue, and it's very important, especially for the youth, which are so far away from God and from belief or even um, even studying the scriptures for themselves because they believe it all to be fairy tales because of the uh, assertions of science, the neo priests of Baal. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, again, if you can't trust Yahuwah with cosmology, how can you trust him with your salvation? Exactly, yes. And I've had several people contact me since they found out, you know, about my position on this. And they said, well, I used to think, you know, Christianity was, well, I won't say what they thought it was because it's vulgar, but but I see you're being honest because every other Christian I've ever talked to says, oh, yeah, they believe the world is round and they believe in the Copernican model and all of that, and yet they can't prove it from the Bible. So to me, I mean, not to me, but to the person who was talking to me, this stuff is just, they're hypocrites. Right. You've got to, be, you've got to follow the truth of the Almighty wherever it leads. Yes, I fully agree. Um, and so you, you you said you have been studying um, in, on this issue. Are, are you planning to do any work or to um, make a further public stance on it or to release any of your investigation or, or are you... As I said, I went, I went on a show and Rob Skiba interviewed me mm -hmm. about this. And I said, you know, I've got a whole bunch of irons in the fire already. I'm trying to write this right. book on spiritual warfare. I'm trying to, to do teachings on, on Torah and, and, and other issues, you know, plus cult apologetics, plus counseling people, plus doing YouTube videos. <sighs> I mean, you know, yes. <laughs> other people are doing this and right. doing it well. 
Yes. And I, I can't be good at everything. I mean, if I had, if I had, you know, like 24 hours a day instead of 16 hours a day in which to do the ministry, I might consider it. But really, I don't, I don't feel the need to reinvent the wheel. Yes, I agree with you. I can, I can, I can just tell people that the Illuminati told me that the that the moon landing was fake, and that kind of be, blew a beginning hole in in what ultimately became a gaping chasm in the side of the the ship of Copernican cosmology, the mm -hmm. round Earth. So I'm just going to leave it to other people right now. I don't really feel. It's my primary calling. I think rather I've, I've let people know because I was having dozens of people, you know, message me on Facebook and email me and say, what about this whole flat earth thing? What about Rob Skiba? You know, blah, blah, blah. And I, and I said to me, it, it's life transforming because yes. it's like, you know, the, the same thing I felt when I got born again. And I realized, you know, that famous line, everything you know is wrong. Everything right. I know about the occult, is wrong. Everything I know about Mormonism is wrong. It's all lies. And the scripture is true. And in the same way, everything I know about astronomy and cosmology, it may very well be a lie. But, you know, let Yahweh be true and every man a liar. Amen. Amen. Well, I know for, you know, myself having took a stance on this and um, been involved in this issue and been criticized heavily for it uh, that we appreciate. I know Rob, he and I are, you know, the, the two most familiar as far as um, uh, those that are believers and also that have done great research in this particular area, that we really appreciate you making a stance and making your investigation known and uh, even not, you know, writing, because I know you're so very busy, but just doing the video that you released and taking a public stance on this issue that um, – because so many people do look up to you and respect you as a pioneer and as a, a person that really um, dedicates themselves to seeking truth and to serving the kingdom that we really do greatly appreciate already what you have done and just – the the simple few um, interviews that you've done even tonight with myself um, we really it's a huge blessing to the community and to those that are on the fence about even investigating or looking into it um, that perhaps um, knowing that you opened yourself to the possibility and that you looked into it and that you found substance with in it that I believe it will encourage others to do the examination themselves and to uh, to open themselves to prove all things to you know uh, as you said with Proverbs eighteen thirteen um, that people need to um, to examine before making judgment and so yeah. we thank you for that greatly. Well, certainly, and I, I appreciate the work that you and and Rob and others have done. I mean, and I, you know, like I. I, you know, I've been poking around, you know, like his, his website. Um, I must confess I hadn't heard of you until a few months ago. But that testing the globe thing, I mean, that's a monumental amount of work yes. he put in. The, and very well done, I might add, you know, the graphics and whatnot. And, you know, and why would I want to do anything else? Uh, you know, I mean, that's between what you have done and what he has done and what other people and, you know, these old – you know, zeotetic astronomy books and, and that kind of stuff. I mean, really, you know, why reinvent the wheel? So, you know, I think it's an important topic. I was blessed to learn that I kind of was there for Rob when he did, he needed some encouragement. And, uh, you know, because that's what we're here for. We're here to uplift each other. But we've got to stand for the scriptures. And we, yes. we can't care about what people think, you know, because, you know, if we did, you know, this is a very unpopular movement. I mean, you know, whether you're talking about standing up for for life or standing up for biblical inerrancy or standing up for the Torah or standing up for the flat earth, you know, any of these things, it's it's not popular in this culture. I mean, people dump on you all the time. They, I mean, they give you the evil eye, they attack us, and we get curses every day. And we just praise Yahweh that he, he, he protects us from them for yes. the most part. But... 
you know, we're very, because we, I mean, let's face it, we got Mormons mad at us, Masons and witches and Catholics, and and now we've got astronomers mad at us. They're probably cursing us too. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And I, I do look forward to Rob putting together his work the, at the testingtheglobe.com uh, uh, into book form. I think it will be greatly beneficial and because uh, he has done so much research and so that's a huge blessing. But uh, also, you know, when you come to this discernment and you open yourself to this revelation, it helps to make other stories make so much more sense. Like Joshua 10 with why it is that God gave Joshua the power to stop the sun and the moon rather than the earth and the moon if it's the earth revolving that causes the sun to go down uh, or Isaiah 38 in second Kings where the sun goes back 10 degrees on the sundial I mean those kind of things um, make a lot more sense and like Ecclesiastes Solomon speaks of 29 times uh, all is folly under the sun uh, you know, and so those kind of dynamics um, completely fit and make sense once you uh, have this as new knowledge and new information. Yes. Yeah, I mean, and these are Bible stories most believers know. Right. And yet they never stop and think, well, okay, if if the sun, like, for example, in Joshua, if the sun, if the, sun go, uh, the earth goes around the sun, then, we, then basically, you know, I'm a father that has stopped the earth from moving. Right. And, you know, and people say, well, of course, he could have done it without having thousands and thousands of people and mountains and everything flying off into space. He could have done that. Yeah, but, you know, there's Occam's razor. You know, the <laughs> fact that often the least complicated uh, explanation is the best, and the, and the least complicated explanation is it what the Bible says is true about the nature of the cosmos and the nature of the earth, and that what science says is a lie? That's yeah. the most obvious explanation. You don't have to go to elaborate things, oh, well, he could have done this or he could have done that. Well, he could have done a lot of things, but he didn't. Right, right. And then the whole thing with the, the sun going back 10 degrees on the sundial, he would have had to stop the earth, reversed its course, and then have it when it moved back 10 degrees, then allowed it to pick up its normal rotation and yet no tsunamis, no earthquakes, no, you know, no water spilling over its basin. I mean, just sure. regular, same old, nothing ever happened. Uh, yeah. Kind of like Superman did in the first Superman movie. <laughs> yeah, right. right. Uh -huh. yeah, absolutely. It's crazy. It's just crazy. People don't bother to think this stuff through. Yes. I fully that, agree. The fluoride in the water. You know, I think it's, you know, all these different things they're giving us and the chemicals to make people's brains dull. And, mm. you know, the mind is a terrible thing to waste. And yet so many people are wasting their minds, you know, yes. on, you know, on dumb TV and dumb movies and, you know, all these different distractions they have for us now. And they're, they're eating terrible food and they're drinking terrible water and, you know, and as a result, the, their minds aren't sharp. They can't critically think. Because that's why Yahuwah says, come, let us reason together. He wants us to sit down with him and be reasonable with him. It's not reasonable to, to combine a heliocentric view of the cosmos with scriptural truth. It is just not reasonable. Yes. And I, I, I really do. I challenge anybody to show me one Bible verse that teaches that the earth is a globe or that the right. earth, you know, spins yes. around. Exactly. exactly. Right. Uh, I would also like to commend you on your work with the, the vaccines and the cancer uh, information, because I believe those are two just utterly critical pieces of the puzzle as far as helping people to understand health and well-being and that uh, if you can make people aware of the vaccines and the poisons, the mercury, the thimerosal in them and how it's tied to, you know, it, kids younger than four years old getting brain cancer, that's not normal. I mean, how is it they, they have, they're not even eating bad stuff yet and 
uh, how is it that they've all of a sudden developed cancer? Uh, and, and when you look, the cancer viruses are in the vaccines. I mean, we people need to be warned. My people are killed for lack of knowledge. I mean, and that is so very important and very relevant. And I commend you in um, doing great work in that regard. Um, can you go ahead, Bill, and give out your website information, where people can go to find your books, your videos, and to support you um, in all that you do. Well, sure, yeah, and we do certainly invite people to to come to our website at withoneaccord.org, and uh, yeah, we do have a donate button there for PayPal. We're totally a faith ministry, and we do give out a tremendous amount of material for free, uh, and you know, we would appreciate if people would pray about supporting us on a regular basis because we know the times are getting tricky out there, you know, the economy and all that. But we trust in our Heavenly Father. But your your prayers and your support are appreciated. Yeah, we have we have the prayers that we recommend people going through for deliverance, uh, for blessing their home, for blessing the land and remitting the shed of the in, setting of innocent blood over the land. We have warfare prayers. We have teachings on... And we have a straight talk that's available free on vaccines, in fact, that you mentioned. Uh, and we have, of course, many, many DVDs. We have the six books that, that I've written, you know, uh, on various aspects of cult apologetics and spiritual warfare. Uh, all of these resources, resources, excuse me, are there. And also we have links to our YouTube channel where we, we try to get out, you know, a teachings. Uh, we've kind of been busy with this DVD, but we normally try to get one out every week. Uh, on various aspects of the scriptures or of current events. So, you know, please follow us on uh, YouTube and subscribe, and please pray about supporting our ministry. It would be greatly appreciated. The name of your YouTube channel, Bill? Yeah, it's just uh, Dr. William Snell. Excellent. All right. Well, we thank you so much for taking the time uh, to join us and in sharing with us. It was a great pleasure and a uh, I've been long looking forward to this interview, and uh, definitely thank you once more. And if you would, we've got two minutes, a final comment for the listening audience. I would just say to cling to truth and to cling to the scriptures and also stay close to our Savior, Yahushua, uh, because these are very dangerous, troublesome times that we're in, and please pray about the, the nature of this election, and I, I really would exhort people to vote. People that think they're going to sit this out because they don't like either candidate, I think that would be a grave mistake. So please pray about voting if you haven't already done so. Seek the Ruach HaKodesh, the set-apart spirit, and and then go and vote for, if you prefer to think of it that way, the lesser of two evils, because our nation is literally tipping in the balance, and we need to stand strong against the forces of evil that Hillary Clinton represents, however way we can. Thank you again, Dr. Bill. We appreciate you, and uh, we'll most certainly be praying for you and asking the listening audience to support you in whatever ways they can. And um, if we can, at some other further future date, um, we'd love to have you back. That would be great. All right. Be blessed, all. Thank you. Shalom. God bless, all. Good night.